Hello. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's been awesome. I actually arrived uh, with my mom on Wednesday, and we've been able to tour around a bit through Victoria. It's been fantastic. So thank you all for the warm welcome, and uh, I'm glad to hear more from all of you about some of your joys and concerns in fishing, and if you have any questions about some of the things happening in the States, specifically in Montana, where I live, I'm more than happy to talk with you about that. So. Uh, I didn't bring my phone up here to watch for time, and I'm terrified of this annoying little bell that I'm afraid JD is going to ring at me, so I tend to be a little long-winded. Hopefully this will be entertaining for you guys. Uh, today you are going to get all kinds of excellent science, um, so much to talk about with your own fisheries. But my talk today is a little bit more about kind of the other side of fly fishing that I specialize in, which is the high adrenaline adventure side of fly fishing. And um, in the US, I specialize in whitewater fly fishing um, as a guide. And so I guide in the Bob Marshall Wilderness and um, Great Bear Wilderness, specifically in Montana. And uh, it's truly the headwaters of the Columbia, um, goes all the way into the Pacific Ocean. And so it's as wild of a trout stream as you can get, and we're targeting specifically native species, West Slope cutthroat trout, and um, there are bull trout in the system as well. If you've ever been to Montana to catch bull trout, it's a pretty special, special thing. And then also in the Frank Church Wilderness in Idaho, both of those are in the wild and scenic river corridors of their areas. And um, so they're non-dammed, and they're pretty crazy in terms of the type of topography. So. Um,
if you live, you're psyched. You're like, that was an adventure. That's that kind of the early, early feeling of just survival was what got our adrenaline up and got us excited just to go out and do it again and do it again and do it again. And that feeling was our reward. That feeling of high energy and stoke was the reward that you got for not dying to the dingoes. So we have that natural desire still after this biological extension for endorphins and adrenaline. Um, and so right now, indulging in the habits beyond the day-to-day um, kind of just going to the grocery store or going to school or going to work or whatever, any of the extra things can sometimes give us a little bit of that adrenaline that we crave from our earliest biological needs. Um, we also want a more interesting story. We get excited to see other people's. Um, and there can be a little risk involved in this when we put too much stock in social media. So sometimes we see those media aspirations and peer pressure um, when you look at what everybody else is doing. And I caution people um, against keeping up with the Joneses in fly fishing because your adventure is your adventure and um, it doesn't have to be this big crazy epic adventure that was somebody else's that may be fake anyway. You know, they hold those fish way out in front of them. They're not really that big. So this is, uh, this is kind of my cheater way of getting this. I'm a one trick pony. I can do literally one trick and this is it. And this is what gets my adrenaline going is jumping off of high rocks into cold water with my dog. And um, I get that feeling of adventure. I do this every you know, time I can when it's warm, when I'm fly fishing. And um, this is kind of, it, it'll happen just like that once. And then the same thing again. And then the same thing again, same dog. And then the same thing again. And then the same thing again. And then, oh yeah, that's not me. But the idea is that I have to satisfy and satiate that craving for some sort of adventure out there in nature. But I'm not gonna go throw triple backflips. You know, that's good enough for me. But I understand that I need to kind of keep that spirit of adventure alive in my day. So wild trout can be the center of your adventure. Here's how. You can make it a mission or a challenge to target specifically wild trout species. Instead of going fishing, if you think about kind of like the X's and O's on a chalkboard and your cricket, does cricket, do you use chalkboards in a locker room and cricket? Probably not, right? Australian rules football. The X's and O's in the back where you say this is us and this is the bad guys and this is how it's gonna go. If you plan your fishing a little bit like that, like okay, we're gonna go, you know, maybe uh, next year we'll think about trying this wild trout stream in this other state or maybe throughout Victoria we've got these kind of wild trout streams. We wanna kind of pick those off the list, tick those off the list as you say. Um, that can be part of, uh, of your adventure. Also targeting multiple various wild trout species throughout your travels. Um, you can go on a wild trout scavenger hunt if there are certain wild trout that you'd like to tick off your list. Research areas where wild trout habitat is the focus. So I really like to go fish places that you know people have tried to help that habitat do better. So when you've heard about somebody doing good works on rivers around Victoria, go and check them out and talk to the people who have done that work and have them maybe take you around if they have time and, and um, give back the appreciation by being part of the next step, which is the fishing. Um, fish to support organizations that support wild trout. It's fascinating to hear about all these this morning and the welcome. And if you kind of focus on fishing because those people are doing that good work and these organizations exist, it's so satisfying once you catch fish because of their good works. Volunteering can get you into some unique opportunities. So sometimes just being part of those good works get you some awesome chances to learn more about how and why that habitat is succeeding and you'll be a better angler because of it. You're gonna understand so much more about that water, about the fish, about the area, and about your connectivity into it. And you can prospect for some unknown places that hold wild trout. We'll hear about that more this afternoon, um, for sure about kind of getting out of your comfort zone and prospecting to round, around to areas that maybe you're not as familiar with, but you know that they're holding wild trout and that's going to be a big adventure. Here's how you can uh, find some adventure within fly fishing, um, or fishing, I guess I should say, not just fly fishing. Um, battling the elements, like I said, a lot of times people won't go out in the rain or in bad weather, um, but if you can manage to not get caught in the middle of a dry lightning 
bushfire, um, then I think that sometimes getting outside when uh, the weather's not ideal can be an excellent reward because there will be fewer people out there. Um, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. Um, for me, it's been really fun in the last couple days just to look around and uh, try to check out some of the wild wildlife. Um, you know, I mean, JD promised us a kangaroo, so we'll see what happens. And since we've said that, everybody else here has been like, oh yeah, we just stepped on one last night. We had four run in front of our car. We haven't, so we haven't seen any yet, but for me, you know, being able to see some of the local species uh, is a huge thing beyond just the fish. Um, and some surprise species. Uh, it's funny, when you're fishing around and maybe you're targeting um, wild brown trout, but you catch something else, sometimes people shake it off of the line because they're like, well, that's not what we came here for. Sometimes the thing you didn't come here for ends up being the big adventure. So don't forget, targeting um, one species can sometimes give you tunnel vision. If you look beyond that tunnel vision, you'll have a blast. Um, same goes for a style of river. I love dynamic rivers. I love rivers that are pool and drop. Maybe it's flat, and then it's wild, and then it's crazy, and there's big boulders, and then it's cobblestone. Um, if you can kind of find some dynamic water, that can keep your interest super peaked and give you that craving for adventure. Um, interesting people. You know, where I live, you know, we, we're called canyon critters. <laughs> and um, we like to meet as many people as we can throughout the country and give them a little taste of um, the locals in Montana. And so, of course, I'm always looking for people. Hopefully, I'm not too annoying meeting the locals. But um, meeting interesting people out there on the rivers is always an adventure. And then I think the main reason that we do this is to share what we've learned. That's the true reason that I guide is because um, sharing the adventure is so fun and so exciting for other people, but it's also great to hear their stories back. So as much sharing as you can do, um, I think will help you have a great time. So beyond the physical part of fly fishing, here's how you can find some adventure. Food, for sure. Um, don't, for, don't just like get the you know cheapo bars all the time and just eat that. After fishing or before fishing, check out whatever local food is in that little village or fishing town or wherever, um, because people have put a lot of work into that. Cultural events, I like to fish around a lot of festival times or things that are happening in um, different neighborhoods. Uh, again, we talked about the wildlife music. I love to incorporate music in the evenings. Um, if anybody's playing wild music, uh, uh, live music, um, going to any of those music concerts or festivals is super fun. Um, sometimes, you know, there's adventures in the nightlife in some of these fishing areas. Family activities, for sure. Um, the opportunities that you already have here with bringing kids in, I think, are huge. Um, and then volunteering, like I mentioned. There's also so much history and lore that we don't give our time, ourselves time to absorb when we go to new places. And I would encourage you to stop in the local museums, read the brochures. People do a lot of work to put some information out there that we as anglers sometimes don't absorb because we're so focused on the fish. And again, we talked about meeting the locals. So I love to plan to not plan for an adventure. And here's how. This is that expecting the unexpected part. For starters, even if you've just already decided you're not going to overstructure yourself and you're not going to say exactly what's going to happen second by second, be sure that you give yourself plenty of time, food, gas, first aid, and tools that you're always ready for the unexpected. You want something to happen. We all want something to happen, but we have to be ready for it. Understand maps and orienteering. Understand where you potentially could go and what could happen if you get out of there. I mean, uh, yesterday we went kind of down a, a almost literal rabbit hole of a road, and JD says, yeah, I've never been down this road. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. So, um, of course, I'm always up for adventure, but we stopped a little early, went down to check out that there would be even a place to turn around the rig uh, before we actually went down to fish. Uh, I think that kind of thing is fun, as long as we can be smart about it, which, of course, JD was. Um, rejecting fishery tunnel vision is what I mentioned earlier about the um, multiple species. You know, this is how to expect the unexpected. Just be open that um, there are other fish out there and maybe do your homework in the beginning or bring with you an identification chart for other fish so that you know what you've caught once you've caught something that's beyond your targeted species. Fishing actually might be the unexpected part of this non-fishing trip that you've planned with your family. Maybe you're going overseas, maybe you're going across the state, the country, continent. Um, you may plan to not fish at all. I would encourage you to bring your stuff. You guys know that, right? Bring 
a small amount of gear <laughs> um, because you may end up fishing in a non-fishing trip, and I always encourage people to bring your stuff and be ready for it just in case. But be sure that your family and friends are fine with that. A couple things about how I experience adventure. Um, one truth is that I always have a river knife. We have to wear life jackets here when we're guiding on the whitewater. Um, and I've never had to use my knife for more than spreading peanut butter. And I always have bear spray on my hip, and I've never had to deploy bear spray. But it's always there, always have it on our flight fishing trips. Uh, another too much information part of this, uh, my first year guiding on Class 5 Whitewater in the Frank Church, I peed in my boat while I was running rapids because I didn't want to have to get out of the river and maybe miss my line. <laughs> and, um, and for me, that was like one of the smartest things I ever did because had I messed up, then I may have never been able to guide there again, but I was able to stay the course, stay in my line, keep my people safe. And they didn't even know I peed my pants. <laughs> it's a self-bailing boat. It's fine. These things happen. Um, this is a little bit of storytelling tell here. My most memorable wild trout story. And I'll start with a little background um, to give you some context for this story. It's in Estonia. And um, this is a wild trout fishery. It's also a native trout. Um, it's brown trout. They're native there, and that's a huge bucket list thing for me. Here are some things that I did uh, as research to set out beforehand. I knew that there's an epic mayfly hatch during summer solstice, and so that's when I wanted to go. Um, I know they have native brown trout. There are very few guides there, so I knew I'd be a, it'd kind of be challenging to find somebody. Um, I wasn't sure this would be something I should do by myself because I did not understand the land ownership or access, and the last thing I wanted to have to research was how to get bailed out of some Estonian prison. So. Um, I knew also that fly fishermen look up to US anglers in Estonia because they've only been free from occupation since 1993, and fly fishing is relatively new there, and um, they're looking for this freedom of adventure that we have in the United States. So they tend to follow American trends. And um, with this new freedom, uh, they're very interested in getting Americans' point of view. So um, with that in mind, I thought I, that I could use that in trying to figure out how to find a guide. Uh, I happened to be in Estonia um, a little bit by accident. I was doing some other work in Finland, and I chose to get out of this boring meeting I was in in Finland and jump on a ferry and go across the Baltic Sea. And then I got on Facebook, and I looked up fly fishing guides in Estonia. And I got Yarko. And I stayed in this hostel in Tallinn. And um, I call up Yarko, and he says, I will take you. And so I said, okay, so um, I stand outside of the hostel so you can see where I am, and up drives this black sports car, this little black sports car, and I can hear this music just like pounding inside. And out steps this seven foot six tall, big Russian guy with the you know, big brow coming over, and um, he had on this wool fisherman's hat, you know, that was like one of those beanies from the wharf, and you know, five days of stubble, and tattoos all the way up his arms, and he's chain smoking. And I'm not exactly sure what his words were, but what I heard was, come with me if you want to fish. <laughs> so I took a quick picture of him, and a picture of the hostel, and texted him to my sister for last known time and place. And <laughs> I jumped in the car with him, and he starts tearing off into the Estonian countryside. And this is awesome. This is like 12th century bombed out castles from an entire history of occupation by multiple countries. And I'm just spellbound by looking at this fairyland of a place. It's fantastic. And um, I can't hear anything other than this Estonian death metal opera rap that he's listening to in this car, just like this crazy head-banging stuff, and he's sitting in here just chain-smoking, chain-smoking, and we're tearing off into this Estonian countryside. And I start thinking, well, I don't know where the hell we're going. And so I have a GPS watch on, and I start kind of bumping the waypoints so that I could at least know where we were. And then I start to realize he starts driving in circles, and then he starts kind of driving back, and then he drives back the other way, and then we cross a bridge that we'd cross three other times. And I went, well, I'm dead, so I'm dead. I haven't even fished yet, and now I'm dead. And I'm not going to be in an Estonian prison because I'm going to be dead. And um, then I realize, oh, no, he's a fisherman. He just doesn't want me to find out where we're going so I can come back. This is how connected we are all across the country. OK, we're good. And um, he's looking at me, seeing I'm touching my watch, and he knows it's a GPS. 
And I'm like, calm down, Yarko. I'm not going to steal your fishing spots. It's fine. So then he says, Hilary, are you hungry? I'm like, well, I can always eat. And so he reaches under the front seat of the driver's side, and he pulls out this styrofoam to-go box, and he opens it, and he grabs what's inside and drops it in my lap, and it's herring. It's just a whole bunch of these herring that he had caught that morning. And um, he picks up one of the herring, and he eats it like the cats in the cartoon. They pull out the whole thing. It's just bones, you know, and he throws them out the window. He does another one, and he throws them out the window, and he's gone through about a dozen of these. And I'm like, (laughs) eating these stinky little herring he had under the front seat of his car. And he says, Hilary, are you thirsty? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he reaches under the front seat again, and he pulls out this giant handle of Jägermeister. And he takes a giant sip of it. And I wasn't even going to ask if he had water, because this is the first thing that he offers. And so he passes it over to me, and I take a giant swig of it, because I know what Jägermeister tastes like, and I'm fine with that, and I find out pretty quick, oh, no, this is homemade moonshine. (laughs) This was straight ether. And he made a huge jug of it, plenty for us for the entire day. This homemade vodka, like moonshine, just, I mean, whoa. And it could have powered this little sports car. And so I'm sucking it down, eating this herring, and, and we're going on, and we're still driving in circles, and then finally he screeches on the brakes. And here we are on this little bridge. And we step off of the little bridge and look down into the water, and it's this beautiful spring creek. And this is at summer solstice, and so by now it's, it, it's night. And it's light outside still, because it's going to stay light until about 1 o'clock in the morning. And this beautiful mayfly hatch and spinnerfall. Spinner's just everywhere. And coming off of the trees, and just everything's coming down toward the water. And I see these fish just sipping, sipping, sipping. And I'm just in a trance, and I start walking down there, and he grabs me. No! You must first give to the river. And he pours half of that thing of vodka into the river. <laughs> and I thought, another reason that we're all connected, we're always pouring a little out to our, to our fish. I don't know if that's a custom here, but I thought that's something we do in the US that is such a crack up that that was the first thing he did. And so then he says, OK, we're ready to fish. And he says, put on your waders. And I said, I didn't bring waders. Oh, he says. So he gets out his extra waders, and he gives them to me. And the guy is six seven or seven six. He was the tallest man I ever saw. And um, he hands me his triple XL waders and a pair of Reebok pumps, size 15. And so I pull on his waders, and I'm rolling them down and pulling them up and rolling them down. And then I look down, and on the leg, there's a Sharpie line written in Sharpie. It says, do not go past here with a big circle around it, because that's where the leak is. Fortunately on me, it was like (laughs) way up here. So okay, and I'm folding the toes over into these size 15 Reebok pumps, and then he, I see him prance like a little deer across this log, across this river. And I'm looking down at these size 15 shoes, and I'm trampling around. And I thought, well, this, this is where the adventure begins. So I get across it safely. And uh, I took so much time. We start kind of going down through this um, spring creek, and I'm mesmerized still, looking at how beautiful it is. And the grass is really high. And I start getting distracted by the beauty, and suddenly Yarko's gone. Yarko, where are you? Where are you? And I don't know why I was compelled to whisper, where are you? I think I was scared, and I wasn't sure where he was, but he's been chain smoking, and so I see this plume of smoke coming from far away. I say, Yarko, what are you doing? And he says, I am protecting you by hiding. (laughs) And I said, how are you protecting me? And from what are you hiding? The wild boars, he says. They will take you down like a deer and drown you. (laughs) And I'm thinking, okay, I maybe look like a little deer standing here in these grasses. And I'm looking around, and sure enough, there are these game trails coming straight out of the grasses into this water where I guess the wild boars just take down these little axis deer that they have there and hold them down into the water. And so now I'm creeping around and looking, and I yell, Yarko, is there anything else I should be afraid of? And he says, no. Oh, yeah, maybe just the guy who owns this place. (laughs) And I thought, God, I knew I was right about the land ownership. I could have gotten killed myself without coming out here with Yarko. So then I creep up my way toward him, and I see what he's looking at on the side of the spring creek, and it was the most beautiful feed. 
and he helps me kind of get ready and we start fishing and we fish together and it was the most amazing fishing I've ever had because these fish are sipping and we're being stealthy and it's so different from my whitewater fly fishing that I have. It was careful, it was quiet, it was peaceful and it was exhilarating. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that I could find that exhilarating feeling without having that high adrenaline whitewater fly fishing. I didn't know, which you guys probably think is crazy because you're accustomed to that with these beautiful waters that you have. And I didn't know I could feel that. And I was so grateful to Yarko, so grateful. And I was so thankful that um, he had brought me to this cool place. And then suddenly I see this huge body waking in the corner. And it's this giant brown trout, giant native wild brown trout. And I said, Yarko, we got to no. We are fishing the small natives with spinners. <laughs> and so it was. This was his zone, and this was my joy and my treat to be able to be here with him. And I had it all on my GPS anyway, so I would be able to come back at some point. <laughs> at the end, it was probably 2 o'clock in the morning, and uh, he drove me back, and I was just so grateful and happy and giddy. And um, he was the most interesting guide I've ever met, but the kindest, the most thoughtful, and he was extremely grateful that I loved his fishery for exactly what it was, and he'd shown me, um, and I was able to respect it. And he hands me his, his card. I expected his card to say, Yarko, maker of horrible booze and fishing guide. And instead it said, Estonian minister of fisheries for the whole country. He's the minister of fishing. That is how new it was. He went to college. He got multiple degrees. He had a degree in fisheries management, fisheries biology, wildlife management, wildlife biology. Um, every single higher education degree he could get, he got so that he could go out and do this, that you guys get to do here all the time. And that by far was, um, in so many ways, my best um, fishing adventure in Estonia. I'm going to blaze through a couple of things now. Um, that it might be helpful to you. What are we looking at at time here? Okay, so this will be a quickie. We'll go through because we only have about five more minutes. Um, travel agencies, um, if you guys want to travel abroad, I would contact the travel agencies so that they can do the heavy lifting for you. Um, it won't cost you anything because these fishing lodges and fishing places are the ones that pay the agencies. So this is kind of a tip. You can just call them and ask them for information about different spots and it's free. Um, hosted trips, if you don't know what a hosted trip is, um, most guides do these in their off season. It means they put together a group of their clients and take them to these other places. And so then you're with somebody, a guide that you feel comfortable with who's not actually guiding you, you just get to travel. Um, some international travel tips. I say when you are gonna travel overseas, make sure that you just bring with you um, a few flies and your fly rod with you on the plane instead of packing it. But there are places that they don't allow you to do that because they think it is a big weapon. And um, I've had people not let me take my fly rod or my reel with me on the plane because I could kill somebody with it. And I'm like, yeah, that lady with her your, like knitting needles is totally going to be the one who's going to kill somebody, not me. But you have to check ahead of time. Um, a couple other things, that, two things I'll point out in international travel tips. Get on guide time with going to the bathroom, and that is morning or night. Don't be accustomed to using the bathroom in the middle of the day and learn how to pee off of a boat. Um, international trip that, uh, tip that I think is super important is to check with the CDC um, health information before you leave, especially with certain um, Zika virus and just certain things that are happening throughout the world. Just check out what some of those health issues are. Um, and if you figure out what's going on with uh, rising and falling tides, um, it can change your fly fishing for sure. Um, I was meant to be doing some bone fishing in the Bahamas um, kind of during these obvious hurricane seasons and we were unable to go in boats, so we were waiting the marls. It was very successful, but um, they wanted to have canceled the trip because the boats couldn't get into certain spots and we um, decided to walk anyway. This particular picture is uh, in Guatemala where um, the, the shuttle driver uh, took me out to the best fishing I ever had, even after having been marlin fishing, sail fishing um, out off Guatemala. He took me to where some of the local kids were surfing and hand lining for permit. I've spent my whole life chasing permit all across the world. And here's kids catching permit off of hand lines, off of a rock pier. 
that was a great way to find out an adventure. Um, this particular, uh, it, this is my um, striped marlin, and in this particular adventure, um, a friend of mine was catching a sailfish and the spool of the reel just fell off into the deep blue sea and with the fish 400 yards away and the first mate jumps off of the boat uh, to get the big spool that's going down, down, down and comes up covered in all of the line and leader around his neck with 200 pound fish out to sea. We pull him in, cutting a line off, cutting, cutting, cutting. This is where you know your quadruple surgeon's knot came in to play. We tied it back on, stuck the spool back onto the rod and landed the fish. Um, I have had lots of injuries over the years, but nothing as significant as uh, ACL, MCL, PCL, meniscus injury in skiing. And um, this, I put this picture up because this is one of those times where I was dumb and dumb, not dumb and smart about it. Don't push, don't, don't say your adventure is so important that you're gonna push it to the limits. I now can't recover from my knee injury because I decided that I had to go rooster fishing a uh, week after blowing my knee out. Bad move. Um, this is uh, in Mexico, and I spent a week learning how to make handmade tortillas, and the woman kept saying, no, this is terrible, and crumpling them up. Okay, now she sounds like Yarko. I can't do my Mexican accent. And, and throwing them away. And uh, finally, at the end of the week, I made a, a tortilla that apparently was suitable enough. She looks at it, and she says, okay, now this is suitable for you to marry. I said, why didn't you tell me that years and years ago? Some domestic travel tips within the US. I hope you'll come and talk to me about this later. I'm happy to give you some ideas about how to travel. This is a picture of my kitchen in the back country. This is kind of what uh, my kitchen looks like um, when I'm guiding in the wilderness. This is how we get into the wilderness. These pictures are about some of the domestic travel. Uh, there's my favorite rapid in the upper middle fork and one of my favorite places in the United States, which is the Florida Keys. And this is in the Pacific Northwest and in Louisiana. I'm showing you these so you can see all the domestic travel opportunities with multiple species. And uh, here I am on the Smith River, looking my best after five days of wilderness travel. And this is in Texas with all the guides comparing and trading flies. And um, one tip I have for you about your own backyard, I know you guys are very involved in sports, team sports and kids sports and stuff. I, got, I found when my kids were younger and doing all these softball tournaments, I'd always bring a rod with me because there's like two hours between each tournament on a Sunday, and I would go find even a local ditch or pond and, and catch fish, or I'd have kids casting into hoops or tying knots. Um, but making kind of fishing break up a sport, kids' sports weekend is huge. Um, making sure you get out into your own backyard is a big deal in multiple seasons. So this is in summer, fall, and winter. And I'll leave you with this, just a question you can ask yourself is what type of adventurer are you? Do you like the peace and quiet, of course, or the party and riot? And this is a, this picture here is my sister who's sitting in the front row here and this is us on the South Holston and she is a very dialed individual and she's trying to be a badass and maybe throw some devil signs up but it's just I love you so she kind of screwed that one up. But um, these kinds of adventures are the types of things that I hope you'll think about incorporating into your life as a different style or a different way of bringing in your own feeling of fly fishing. And if anybody has any questions for me about anything else, um, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I think we don't have time now, but um, I'll be around all day. Thank you. <laughs> Unless you wanted to take one or two, or are we good? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, for us, um, we have seen such dramatic change in Glacier National Park. Obviously, the name kind of gives that away, but um, we've gone from 180 glaciers to right now 22, 23 glaciers that many are just snowfields. So time is of the essence, and um, we have such access to the world's top climatologists right there. Um, that they've told us that systemic change is the most important thing. So that's why I've taken uh, my advocacy from uh, beyond just doing kind of what we can do as single individuals to going to Washington, D.C. Um, so I go to Washington, D.C.